In this micro lecture, I'd like to talk about igneous rocks, uh, how they form, and the connection of different rock types to plate tectonics. This model shows the order of crystallization for minerals from a melted rock. Starting from a higher temperature, the sample is completely molten, about 1225 degrees centigrade. As we cool the rock, crystallization, or cool the magma, crystallization starts, and the first mineral that crystallizes is olivine. This is followed by crystallization of plagioclase, around 1200 degrees. And then olivine and plagioclase, plagioclase continue to crystallize as the temperature drops. The next mineral that appears is pyroxene at about 1100 degrees. And then at 1100 degrees centigrade, the sample is completely solid, which results in a rock that consists of olivine, calcium rich plagioclase, and pyroxene. This is the typical uh, minerals that you find in a basalt. This information was determined in two ways. One from just uh, observations of natural rocks as well as lab experiments. Now if we reverse the process, we have a solid basalt at room temperature. We heat it up to 11 degrees. The first mineral to melt is pyroxene and plagioclase, olivine, continues to melt as the temperature increases. And then finally, olivine melts uh, and with the last trace is at about 1,225 degrees. And then the sample is completely molten at 1,225 degrees. Now the reason why this is important is it highlights which minerals you would expect to find in high temperature magmas and which minerals you'd expect to find as the melt cools. Next topic is how do you produce melted rocks? Where are the conditions on the earth hot enough to melt rocks up that need require temperatures up to 1100 degrees? Now to emphasize in this uh, at this point that there are no large layers or lakes or ponds of magma below the Earth's surface. The Earth's surface is, for the most part, except for the outer core, a solid, and there are only certain areas that are either hot enough or wet enough to melt. And these are areas where you find production of volcanoes and at depth, uh, plutonic igneous rocks. So we're gonna look at three different models that explain how you produce melted rocks, and then connect those to plate tectonic settings. Here's the first model. This is a graph showing temperature on the horizontal axis and depth on the vertical. So it's essentially a cross section to the Earth. Now there are these features called geothermal gradients, and they mark the temperature as you go down deeper in the Earth. So this is for below continents temperature increases, and this is for below um, uh, in ocean crust, okay, below ocean. So notice that this is much shallower, it gets hotter sooner than continents. Um, that's because it's thinner and it's uh, near the warmer mantle, so that's why it gets hotter. Now these two blue lines out here show the onset of melting, so this is where rocks will start to melt and this is where rocks will completely melt. So notice that the geothermal gradient for the continents never intersects these blue lines. Therefore, there are, there's no melting of continental rocks uh, where the geothermal is normal. Okay, so to melt this, you need some special conditions. However, there are places very deep where you get uh, the intersection between the geothermal gradient and the melting, which means that some melting is occurring and that's about where the asthenosphere is. So this is where some melting occurs um, in certain parts of the ocean. And these are found um, along divergent uh, areas. Now we can enhance the melting potential of rocks through a couple of processes. 
One process is by bringing the rock closer to the surface. So as rocks move closer to the surface, the pressure decreases and we can cross this blue line and therefore start melting the rock. This is called decompression melting. Okay, so here's your normal geothermal gradient. This rock begins to move to lower pressures, which means higher in the Earth's crust and then starts to melting. We'll see an example of where this occurs in a second. We can connect this to that idea of melting. So here is where rising uh, rocks or decreasing pressure crosses the boundary of melting and therefore produces some melted igneous rocks. So that's what's occurring here. The mantle's ascending, it's crossing that boundary, and therefore melting occurs to produce this lump of magma. So there's an example of that decompression melting. Here's another place that um, igneous rocks form. As a plate subducts, okay, it gets to a temperature where a combination of the amount of water and the temperature causes it to melt. Now this stuff moves through the asthenosphere up into the crust and forms volcanoes. These volcanoes are intermediate in composition, dacites and andesites, and the material down below begins to cool and this stuff cools to form the andesites um, excuse me, the diorites and um, other intermediate rocks. Okay, so how does this fit into what we talked before? So once again, the plate's descending, it's releasing water because it's getting hot, and that decreases the melting temperature so that those rocks can start to melt. The magma forms, rises to the surface to produce the volcanic features or cools to produce the um, plutonic rocks of the same composition. We can summarize these features in this schematic diagram of, a, of several plate boundaries. So let's highlight the rocks that we know and love. Okay, so here we have a divergent boundary, continental crust, ocean crust dipping down in a, in a uh, subduction zone. So this is what you need to know. You need to know that andesites and diorites, the intermediate igneous rocks, are characteristic of subduction zone related um, igneous activity. You need to know that basalts and gabbros are associated with ocean crust and are associated with diverging boundaries. You can also get peridotite that forms at depth in these environments. You need to know that you can also get basalt and scoria um, and other mafic rocks from hot spot volcanoes that come out through the continent. You also need to know finally that where magma is contaminated by continental crust, if it mixes some continental crust, you can get granites forming at depth and rhyolites forming at the surface. So in order to form these really felsic magmas, you have to have some input of these continental um, rocks, which increases the silica content. My suggestion would be to reproduce this diagram in your notes, start feeding in information related to the rock types, and also you might consider superimposing on this um, where earthquakes occur. I hope this helps. Please ask questions if you have any. Thanks.